Okay, please find a seat. Please find your seat. We're going to get started here. Okay, once this group finds their seat, thank you. All right, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Nathan. I am the new associate youth ministry pastor here. So, yes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I am so excited to get to spend this next time with you, and I got blessed with the opportunity to preach tonight. So, I'm going to bring you guys the word. And when I was younger, I was a PK. For those of you that don't know what that is, it means I was a pastor's kid. So I was always at church all the time. I was going to retreats. I was going to camps. We were the first person to get to church and the last people to leave church. I was actually raised for the first two or three years of my life on a summer camp. So I was a camp kid too. But then we moved to Gresham. And because I was around church so often, I got pretty good at speaking the Christianese language, right? I knew a ton of the big fancy words, all the stories from the Bible. I even knew the stories in the Old Testament because I had it up here, come on. And when I was in middle school and high school, I adored youth group. I felt like it was my kingdom because anytime a pastor or a leader would ask a question, whew, his hand was raised so fast. I knew all the answers and I said it so smartly. I would strut around thinking it was my place. You know, I would answer everything. I was that kid in small group that is answering every single question and the leader has to stop calling on him because he's just getting too annoying. You know, the one that takes 10 minutes to answer like a super basic question, like what was your favorite part of the passage? And then half a small group is gone because he's talked the whole time. That was me. That was me. You guys know who I'm talking about. That was me. And why, why did I do this? I did because I wanted everyone to know how smart and holy I was, right? I wanted the recognition, but my heart was off. All I could think about was what these kids at church and at youth group thought of me. I didn't even consider what God was thinking of me. Because my heart was in the wrong place, I totally missed the whole point of all these things I was going to. Now, this is something I think we can all fall into, whether it's in small groups or worship, but especially in prayer. And this happens so often with prayer. And maybe you're not like me. Maybe you're not the show-off kid that wants to use all of his fancy words. Maybe you feel the exact opposite. Maybe you're terrified to pray. Maybe whenever a small group ends and they ask who's going to pray for you, you have never once raised your hand because you're embarrassed that you might say something dumb and you're not smart enough and you're just, it's too embarrassing that other people might make fun of you. You might make a fool of yourself. Both of these stem from the same place. Our hearts are in the wrong spot. We care so much what people around us are thinking, we completely lose sight of the whole purpose of prayer. And that's God. We're talking to God. But today we get to read Jesus' teaching about this and learn how to do it the right way so we don't have to do that anymore. So if you guys have been here, we're in the Sermon on the Mount series. And today we're going to be going through Matthew 6, 5 through 15. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there. And so from context of this chapter, Jesus is teaching about the danger of pride and doing these righteous things for your own recognition. And so these verses we're focusing on today are that problem in relationship to prayer. So I'm going to read this passage for us. It's only 10 verses. All right. The Lord's Prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And, you're, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay. A lot of you have probably heard that before. It's a pretty common passage. So what's Jesus teaching about? What's this about? It's about prayer, right? Easy answer. I already said it, but that's okay. I thought you guys might have been listening. Um, Jesus wants us to pray. He's teaching that God wants us to pray. Now you might be saying, 
I know I'm supposed to pray. Come on, that's Christian 101. But this passage teaches us how and why we're going to pray. So I'm going to go through four points that we find in the text. I think you guys can handle four. You guys are pretty smart. First one, we're supposed to pray personally, all right? Number two, we're supposed to pray without performance. Number three, we're supposed to pray praises. And then number four, we are supposed to pray for provisions, all right? So our first point is that we're supposed to pray personally. And this means that you're supposed to know who you're actually talking to in your prayers. And that's the person that you're supposed to be focusing on. In verses 5 and in verses 6, we read about these hypocrites. And they're out in the streets and in the synagogues and in the temples, and they're preaching super loudly so that everyone around them can hear them. But what were they actually doing? They were being just like me in middle school and high school. They were trying to show off. They were trying to show people how smart and how cool and how righteous they are by praying out loud in public. Their hearts weren't in the right place. These hypocrites were praying so the people around them could hear them, not so that God can hear them. They were completely talking to the wrong person. I think we've all been on both sides of when someone's heart isn't in the right place and we get hurt by that. A great example is with my amazing girlfriend, Isabel. She's here tonight. Yeah. Woo! Lucky man right here. Luckiest man. And she's a normal person. She's a normal human being. And so she likes to take pictures with me. And you know, like normal boyfriend and girlfriend stuff at fancy events and all these things, she wants to take pictures with me. But little fact about Nathan is I'm the worst, I'm the least photogenic person on this planet. So I hate that. She knows. And so every time we take a photo, instead of being serious and being like a nice boyfriend and trying to do something nice for her, I just completely goof off. And like, I make it my goal to make the camera person laugh instead of like trying to smile myself. I'm just trying to make everyone around me think that it's funny. I'm so focused on what the people around me think and who the, what the person taking the picture thinks of me that I'm not even caring at all about Isabel's desires. I'm completely neglecting her. All, and all she wants to do is have a nice photo, nice photo with me. And that sucks for her, right? Like she's asking me to do something so simple and so nice that we all can do and that would make her so happy but instead, I'm focusing on my pride and what other people think about me. And I'm positive that each of you guys have experienced the same sort of thing. You've probably been on both sides of this. But if it hurts so bad, and it really sucks to be ignored, then why do we do it so often to God? Why do we ignore God so often? Because so often when we pray, we put the God of the universe on the back burner. Our hearts are so prideful that we don't even remember who we're talking to. It's a conversation, and we forget the person that we're talking to. I think I notice myself doing this in worship a lot, too. Many times we get so caught up in how we sound, how we look, if our crush is close enough that she can hear that we don't know how to sing, you know, which hand we put up or both or when on the bridge or on the chorus. And all we think about is what they're seeing of us. If, you know, the person with the photo is going to come around and get a nice picture of you, you know what I mean? That's all you're thinking about. And you forget we're doing one of the most sacred things that we can possibly do and sing praises and worship to our God. We're so focused on what other people think about us that we're not even worshiping God. And so instead of doing this, Jesus teaches us to pray personally. He instructs us to go into our rooms and close the door and pray to our God, our Father, in secret. Because praying is supposed to be a conversation that we're having with God, so he should obviously be the one that we're focused on and not what other people think about us. As God created us, as God keeps the earth spinning, he keeps the sun shining. He's the one that controls everything. He deserves our humility and our undivided attention. If anyone, any time in history deserved our attention, it's our God. So when we're praying, when we're talking to him, he needs to be our focus. Now, this passage is not saying don't pray in public. Um, Rhett just prayed. I'm going to pray. And so that's not what this is saying. This is about our heart. God can listen to you if you're in public, if you're in Antarctica by yourself in the penguins. He can hear you anywhere. This is about where your heart is. Are you talking to him? Are you talking for other people to hear you? We need to pray to God personally. That's the first point. And that's our motivation behind what we're doing. But how do we actually pray? Brings us to our second point. We need to pray without performance. 
Verses 7 and verses 8 of this passage introduce to us another group of people that we're not supposed to pray like. These are the Gentiles. And Gentiles is a term that is given most often to anybody that's not a Jew, right? And so there's a lot of different beliefs about God with the Gentiles and how they worship. And Jesus describes this group of people as heaping up empty phrases, and they think that they will be heard by their many words. And so what Jesus means with his people is that they believed they had to work so, so hard to get God's attention. They thought they had to pray the same prayer thousands of times in one day with these big fancy words over and over in hopes that God would maybe hear them. And this makes me think of a scene in Harry Potter in the first movie. I don't know if you've seen it, but that scene when he gets his Hogwarts letter, his admission letter, and they're trying to send it to him, but his aunt and uncle throw it away so he can't read it. And so they send thousands of letters. It's coming through the chimney. It's coming under the door. It's coming in the mailbox. It's coming through the windows. And what they're doing is they're sending so many letters in hopes that Harry would get one of them. They needed so many so that he could get one. And that's what these Gentiles are doing. They think that God's too busy. They think that he's uninterested in them. And they think that they need to spam him in order to get their message across. But that's not what Jesus tells us. He says that we should not be like them because our Father knows what we need before we even ask him. God knows what we need before we even ask him. This is the God that we're talking to, the one that loves us so much and wants us to talk to us and wants to have a relationship with us. Not only do we not need to work for his attention, he's begging for our attention. We don't have to convince him to listen to us. He knows the desires of our heart and is always listening. This is the God who created the universe. He sent his son down to earth to die as a sacrifice for your sins because of how much he loves you. He's always listening. And isn't that amazing? It's hard to get people to listen to us. I feel like no one wants to listen to me half the time. My brothers don't want to listen to me. A lot of the time, you guys don't want to listen to me. I guarantee when we go to small groups, each one of us is going to get interrupted at one point. Because it's hard to get people to listen. But the best, most amazing, most holy thing in all of existence, God always listens. We don't have to perform for him. Because he's ready and waiting for us. And that's our point number two. So point three and four come from this next section called the Lord's Prayer. Most of you have probably heard it. And this is actually an example prayer that God gives us, that Jesus teaches us. And it's a template that we can follow and use while we pray. And so this brings us to point three. We need to pray our praises. The very first thing in this prayer is our Father in heaven. So we know who we're talking to, God, our Father. We said that in point one, pray to him personally, and Jesus shows us that in his example prayer. God, our Father, that's who we're praying to. And now the praise starts. He says, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So to start with, hallowed, weird word. We don't use it very much anymore. It basically means to be holy or to be revered or to be respected. So when Jesus says, hallowed be your name, he's saying, God, God, your name is holy. We deeply love you and respect you, and we hope that others feel this way too. The next two things in this section are your kingdom come and your will be done. And these two things are saying that God is king, and we desire for him to reign here on earth, and that he would be the king over everyone's hearts, and that his will would be done. In heaven, God is king. Everyone knows that and acts accordingly. They constantly praise him, they worship him, they respect his kingship. The people on the angels there desire the advancement of his kingdom, and that everyone would come to know and follow him. And what Jesus is saying is that we should pray that earth becomes that way. That we would want everyone to know and love God and to respect and follow him. That should be part of our prayer, full of praise. Think about it this way. If you're talking to let's say LeBron or The Rock, or I don't know if you like music, maybe Harry Styles, come on. We would definitely compliment them if we were having a conversation. Let's be real, right? Oh, I'm such a big fan. I love that shot that you made, you know, to win. I love that song that you sang that one time. I like the movies that you're in. Like, we would praise them because we respect them. We would tell them that we like them because we do. And when you like someone enough, what do you do? You tell them about it. 
every time we pray, we are talking to someone who is cooler and more amazing than anything here on earth. So how much more praise should we give God than anything else? He deserves unlimited praise. Because if we even have a fraction of an understanding of who God is, we can't help but praise him. That's how good he is. If you know him, you can't help it. You have to praise him because of the goodness that he has and the things that he has done for you. But prayer is also more than just praises. And that leads us to our last point, the provision, praying for provision. The second half of this prayer that Jesus gives us focuses on the things that we want and that we need. And we ask our Father for this provision. Jesus says here, give us today our daily bread. This is a prayer for food on the table, for nourishment. It takes a lot for us to be alive, right? We need food, we need water. God knows those things. He wants us to ask for those things. He loves listening and he loves providing what we need. And he wants us to come to him and to ask. The next thing it says, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. This is asking for God to forgive us from our wrongs that we've done against him, that we've done against other people. And trust me, there's a lot of those. Whether or not you want to admit it, we do that all the time. And it also states that we're going to forgive others. And later in this chapter, in verses 14 and 15, there's even an additional section that talks about forgiveness and how important it is. Because if we have accepted God's forgiveness of his son dying on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, we've accepted that. We've accepted the forgiveness for our debt. We cannot help but forgive others. We are required and called to do that. And it will be in our very nature as children of God. It's still hard though, right? It's so hard to forgive. When people hurt us, we don't want to forgive them. When you get cut off in traffic. Mm. When someone bails on you last minute when you had plans. Or when your siblings eat the leftover pasta that you had in the fridge that you were looking forward to eating all day and you marked it with your name and told no one else to eat it and they still ate it. That's hard to forgive. There's a lot of things that are hard to forgive. And that's why it's important for us to pray. It's important for us to pray for God's help and to remember how often we need his forgiveness. Every one of you and all of us leaders require his forgiveness every single day, and we're supposed to pray for that. And lastly, this prayer says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is just a prayer that God would provide safety and protection. The world's hard. The world's scary. We need protection. And just because we pray for these things doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily be exactly what we want. We know he's listening. We know that he loves us. We know that he wants to provide for us. But often we're praying for what we think is best. And God knows what is best. Sometimes those don't match up. And that can be hard. But when that happens, that's where we have to trust God and his faithfulness. That he knows what's best. And that he knows more than we do. Because I couldn't create the earth. I don't think any of you could. He obviously knows more than us. And so I want to trust him. I want to trust his plan. But even if we don't know if it's going to come true, Jesus still tells us to ask. And I think this is the part of prayer that comes most naturally. Asking for things. Come on. We all ask for things all the time. Believe it or not, I did not always like being a redhead. I know. Shocker. Shocker. For most of my grade school years, I hated that I had red hair. I had pale skin and freckles all over. I had buck teeth. I couldn't even close my mouth. I hated it. I hated it. I know, glow up, right? Come on. Woo! Um, yeah. But I would pray every night. I would pray every night that I would wake up with thick, dark hair and tan skin. Every night I would pray that. I said I wanted to look like Superman. Newsflash, it didn't happen. And I would beg God to change my appearance. I was insecure. I was insecure how I looked. Understandably. And I prayed that it would change. And I knew it wasn't likely to come true, but I still prayed for it anyway. Now I'm confident that each one of you has an insecurity. And I'm willing to bet most of you have prayed that it would go away. 
And I don't think those prayers are wrong. I don't think they're wrong. We read in Philippians 4, Paul writes, By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear your requests. So I don't think it's wrong to pray that insecurity would go away, that you'd do well on a test, that a friendship would deepen, that a loved one would heal. Those are requests. I think they're all good. And we can all bring them before the Lord and ask him to help us and ask him to provide for us. However, we've seen in this example of prayer, there needs to be just more. We first praised God before we asked for his provision. God isn't a genie in a lamp. We can't ask him for things all day and expect him to grant us everything that we want. The example prayer that Jesus gave us has two parts, praise and provision. And our prayer should replicate that. It doesn't need to be a set in stone system where we pray like this every day, half provision, half praise. But it's just supposed to help us understand how we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to have both of these elements in our prayers. But how do we actually do this? What are some next steps? What's some application? First, shocker, we have to pray. When I was in middle school and high school, unless I was praying for insecurities or that I'd get an A or, you know, something like that, I wasn't praying very often. How many of you guys prayed multiple times today? How many of you guys lifted your eyes to the Lord and praised him and asked him for something? We know we're supposed to do it, but do we? Do you? What's the point of knowing everything about prayer? What's the point of knowing every single thing about prayer if you don't pray? Tonight's message is useless if you don't actually pray. You can be the smartest person in the world. If you don't live it out, if you don't act it out, what is the purpose of your knowledge? So we must actually pray, and we must actually pray regularly. And if you don't know God, if you don't have a relationship with him, and this is too scary and too new, then that should come first. You should know God. You should commit yourself to him. And if you have any questions or concerns about that, please come to a leader. Please ask one of us. That's why we're here, so that you would know him better and that you would love him. That's what he wants. That's what we want for you. So if that's where you're at, that's your next step. And please ask us about that. But if you do have a relationship with him, then your next steps are simply to put these things you've learned tonight into action. When you pray, be personal. Remember that you're praying to God. He's the one you should be focused on and not other people's opinions. Don't be like me in high school or the hypocrites where their hearts are in the wrong place. Be humble. God deserves our full attention. Be without performance when you pray. You don't need to get God's attention. You don't need to use long, fancy words. Be honest with God. He wants to listen to you. He wants them to listen to the things that you're asking. You don't need to be fake with him. I don't know if you've read the Psalms, but our boy David prayed some crazy prayers. He said some weird things that I've never said in my life. And he said them to God. Don't be afraid to pray. Pray what you feel. Pray your heart. He wants to hear it. He already knows it. You're not going to surprise him. So don't be fake. What's the purpose of a fake prayer? If they know what's true, then just be honest with him. He's dying to listen to you. He wants to listen to your voice, so pray without performance. And pray praises. Tell God how much you love him. Tell God how great he is. Honor him and his name. Honor his kingdom and his will. And this is a cycle. If you start doing this, you'll start noticing him. If you start praising him, you'll notice his work in your life, and you won't be able to help yourself. You're going to start praising him more and more. And as this cycle goes and the snowball rolls, you won't be able to stop yourself from praising him. The problem won't be starting. The problem will be stopping, and that's not a problem. All right? Praise God with your prayers. Notice the work in his life, in your life. And then pray for provision. Ask God to help you where you're at. He wants to help you. He wants to guide for you. Don't expect him to do what you want, but ask for it. Pray for the things that you need and ask him for your hopes. Each one of you guys can do this right now. We're going to go to our small groups in just a second, and we're going to have time to pray. 
I hope all of you take that opportunity. I hope all of you are willing to pray. Do these things tonight. This is a very applicable message. You could be walking to your small group, praying to God, doing what I taught you tonight, doing what this passage teaches tonight. Focus on him. Don't be embarrassed. We're all just talking to the same person. Don't be a show off. You're not any better than the rest of us. Be personal. Don't perform. Give him the praise he deserves and ask for his provision. Please pray frequently. I'm begging you because God deserves your honor and your prayers. He longs for that and he's dying to listen to your voice. Please, please pray regularly to him. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are too good, God. We can't even comprehend your goodness. We're so grateful that we get to be here in a church where we get to worship you. We get to hear your word. We get to be with fellowship of other people that believe what we do, God. Thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done, for the work that you've done in each one of our lives. I pray that we would understand that, that we would desire you more, and that we would speak to you regularly. As we go out to our small groups, I pray for focused minds, quiet mouths, God, and that our ears would be open and our hearts would be open to talk and to pray. And that we would just love you more, God. You deserve all the love that we can give. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. You guys can go to your small groups. I am always on your side.